Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads and it is finally the time to talk about the top books that I read in 2022. So I am actually very, very stingy with five star ratings. It takes a lot for a book to get a five star rating for me. And because of that, I only rated three books in 2022 five stars and I rated four 4.5 stars. So today we are going to talk about the three that I rated five stars and the four that I rated 4.5 stars. Now I know a lot of people typically start these videos with their lowest rated and work their way up to the best. However, the three best books that I'm about to talk about, I have already talked about multiple times on this channel and the three best books have not changed since I did my mid year book freak out tag when I first started filming again. So if you've been active on my channel since I've been active back on my channel, you will already know what the three top books that I read in 2022 are. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and talk about them again, hopefully briefly, and then I want to give a little bit more attention to the four 4.5 stars, which I don't feel like I have talked about as much on my channel or when I wasn't filming and I read these books. Maybe they haven't been mentioned since then. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about my five star ratings. They are in no particular order. These five star books are all very different books and so I love them for very different reasons. So I don't really think I can say that I love one more than another. So they're not going to be in any particular order. We're just going to talk about them and then we're just going to move on into the 4.5 star. So the first book that I'm going to talk about today, The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. Y'all know that I'm the biggest Kristen Hanna fangirl because I have yet to find an author aside from Taylor Jenkins Reid that can write characters the way that Kristen Hanna does. She writes characters that just jump off the page and that will ultimately break your heart in the end. She really pulls you into the story. She is able to do great atmosphere, great character building. It's very hard to reach her level in my opinion. I have read so many books by her at this point and every single time I am just in awe and blown away by the way that she is able to tell a story and just wrap you in the atmosphere, make you feel like you are there, especially with her historical settings. And that is one reason why I just love The Four Winds so much. So this is set in the early 1930s in Texas during the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl ravaged the plains during the Great Depression and this follows Elsa as she is struggling to keep her two children alive and fed and well because with the Dust Bowl that means no rain and with no rain that means no crops and with no crops that means no food. And so farmers in these areas are really, really struggling. And because farmers in these areas are struggling, everybody else is struggling as well. On top of that, the dust is literally infecting people. It is getting inside their lungs and it's causing them to be ill. It is just a time of extreme devastation. And Elsa is doing everything that she possibly can for her family, especially after her husband basically ups and abandons them. And so she is living on the farm of her in-laws with her two children. It is a horrific time for these people. And hoping to be able to provide a better life for her children, she makes the decision to join many other people who are migrating to California where there is supposed to be work and there is supposed to be land that is not ravaged by the Dust Bowl. She thinks that they are going to get there and that they are going to be able to make it work and that they are going to be able to build a better life. But alas, when she gets there, she finds that things are not better. In some ways they are worse because she is one of many, 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 many people who have uprooted their family to move to California. So they are living in these vagrant camps. They are living in poor conditions. They are just trying to find work. And so like she's getting random jobs, maybe like picking cotton in a field working for a meager pittance. Not to mention in California, she's facing extreme extreme prejudice because a lot of people there don't want her kind there. They don't want Okies there and she's considered an Okie even though she's not actually from Oklahoma. You know, she's part of that migrant group that is coming because they were ravaged by the Dust Bowl and there are a lot of people that don't want her there. They don't look upon her and her family kindly and so they are not kind to them. They don't want to help them at all and so that is an extra level of difficulty that Elsa and her family are facing in California. But of course the power of a mother's love is just such a fierce motivator and Elsa was an indomitable character. She had such an enduring spirit and she was never going to stop fighting for her children and fighting to provide a better life for them. This book was about so many things. It was just this harrowing tale about survival and bravery and doing what you had to do to make sure that you and your children were safe and fed. It was of course a story about a mother who was going to do absolutely everything for her children to ensure their survival. And in a lot of ways, it was also about Elsa finding her voice and fighting for what was right. And then, like I said, Kristen Hanna is a master of atmosphere. And so when you're reading this, you are transported back to the 1930s in Texas. You are transported to that barren, desolate land. You can feel the dust in your lungs. We're going to be so thirsty while you're reading this book because the atmosphere is just so real. It is a character unto itself in this book. I really fell in love with Elsa and her story. I can't necessarily say that I enjoyed her journey. It was definitely very rough and very harrowing, but as all Chris and Hannah books, you can't just help but root for and fall in love with these characters. And that is why this made it into one of the top books that I read in 2022. I highly, highly recommend. And this next book, which was harrowing and raw for its own reasons, 
these reminders of him by Colleen Hoover. This follows our main character Kenna and five years prior to the start of the story she made a devastating mistake that kind of end up leading to the death of her love Scotty. She's actually spent the past five years in prison paying for that mistake and prior to her entering prison she found out that she was pregnant and knowing that she was gonna have to do something to ensure the survival of her child she actually gave up custody to Scotty's parents and now Kenna has been released and she's determined to go have a relationship with her daughter Diem. So now she's returning to the town in which the tragedy occurred hoping to build a relationship with her daughter but she knows that it's not going to be easy. She knows that there are going to be a lot of obstacles to overcome not the least of which is going to be Scotty's parents who really don't want anything to do with her and they certainly don't want her to have a relationship with Diem especially after what happened to their son. And so as soon as Kenna gets into town she actually goes into this bar and she meets Ledger Ward. Now Ledger Ward is actually a person who had a big connection to Scotty and who now has a really big relationship with her daughter Diem. And when Ledger finds out who she is of course he's very frustrated. He is sickened. He absolutely hates her. He wants nothing to do with her. But as he starts to get to know her more he realizes the type of person that she is and he realizes that Diem could only benefit by having her mother in her life. And so this actually puts Ledger into a really awkward position because he's very close with Scotty's parents and now he's very close to Diem and he knows that by trying to help kind of have a relationship with Diem he is almost kind of betraying Scotty's parents but he also believes that Scotty would want Kenna to have a relationship with their daughter and so he's just torn into a million pieces because he feels like he's being disloyal to Scotty's parents but he also feels like he's being loyal to Scotty at the very same time and despite these impossible circumstances Kenna and Ledger end up forming a really incredible bond and they start to grow into something more than acquaintances friends and you know eventually into lovers and it was just such a beautiful powerful and like I said it was a raw story I, I felt like this was a little bit more raw than some of the other books that I've read by Colleen Hoover. This is told from both Kenna and Ledger's perspective so you definitely get to see their viewpoints on what is happening. You get to see Kenna as she is struggling for redemption and absolution. It's a journey about her trying to meet her daughter and have a relationship with her daughter and trying to atone from all the mistakes that she made in the past. She's trying to prove her worth. She's trying to prove that she's not a bad person that she just made one very very bad mistake and that she loves her daughter and wants to be a part of her life. And of course for Ledger it really is a story about forgiveness. He has to overcome these years of hatred and see past his loss to the person that is standing in front of him and he kind of sees past all of that and he is able to do what he needs to do to help kind of have that relationship with her daughter. And so even though it is like relatively short overall it definitely packs a severe emotional punch. It is agonizing, it is heart-wrenching because on the one hand you are rooting for Kenna but you can't help but be horrified by the past and what happened. You can't help but look at her in disgust sometimes over what happened and you can kind of understand where Ledger's hatred comes from but at the same time you also see who she is as a person. You know that it was just one mistake and you know that she just is trying to make up for those mistakes and she's just wanting to meet her daughter. That's all that she wants. Is she wants to be a mother to her daughter. And then of course at the same time while you are rooting for Kenna you are also frustrated with Ledger because of his part in at first trying to keep Kenna away from her daughter but then again like I said at the same time you also understand why he is doing that and then you of course come to root for Ledger as he starts to get over his hatred and he starts to forgive Kenna and he starts to work with her so there were just a lot of factors going on in the story I thought it was beautiful it was powerful it was poignant I just love what Colleen Hoover was able to do here with these characters you know I'm very 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 rarely disappointed with Colleen Hoover and this was just stunning this was next level in my opinion so it was an easy five stars for me. Next I have Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby. I cannot sing the praises of this book enough however I'm going to admit that this is not for everybody because this is probably the most gritty, gruesome, violent, provocative, profane book that I have ever read but I was here for absolutely every second of it but if you don't think that you are going to be able to handle the subject matter in this because like I said it is very dark, it is very violent, I would highly recommend looking up trigger warnings for this book just to see if you would be able to handle it because this is absolutely not for everybody but it was for me wholeheartedly. So this follows two fathers, Ike Randolph and Buddy Lee. One is black, one is white. They are two very, very different men, but they do have two things in common. The first is that they are criminals or at least past criminals. They have spent their fair share of their past in prison. And they also have the fact that their two sons, Derek and Isaiah, were gay and were married to each other. And this is something that they did not approve of. They did not approve of their sons being gay and being married to each other. And of course, on top of that, there were the complications that they were in an interracial relationship. And another thing that they come to have in common is the fact that they want vengeance for their sons' murders because they don't feel like the police are taking it seriously. They don't feel that the police are doing enough and they want to find out who killed their boys. So these two men take it upon themselves to find out who killed their boys and enact the vengeance that they so righteously deserve. So at its core this story is a story of vengeance. That is 100% the fuel for the plot. However it goes so much deeper than that. It is definitely a story about grief. It is not just grief about mourning the person that you lost but it's also mourning the time that you could have spent with them and you didn't because like I said these two sons were basically estranged from their fathers because their fathers couldn't accept them for who they were. And so that kind of leads into this immeasurable guilt that these two fathers had because they know that they didn't love their sons the way that they deserved and 
should have been loved. They treated their sons basically as abominations, something worthy of shame and disgust. And now that's coming back to bite them because their sons are no longer around. They can no longer make up for that fact. And even though they both loved their sons dearly, they couldn't get over themselves enough to overlook the fact that they didn't necessarily agree with their son's lifestyle just to still love them and treat them as human beings. And so now they're dealing with that grief and that immeasurable guilt because they're never going to be able to make that right again. And that's another aspect and layer of this too, is that they feel like getting vengeance for their sons is a way that they can show their sons how much they loved and cared about them. This story also discusses the insane amount of hatred and ignorance that floods through society, whether it is about homosexuality, whether it is about race, there were a lot of very important conversations in here about those two things and how anybody could be prejudiced against anything. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your class. It doesn't matter your skin color. None of that matters. Everybody can be extremely prejudiced against something. I feel like S.A. Cosby just did this stunning job of taking a story about violent vengeance and one that I must say is disgustingly satisfying to read. Like you are actively rooting for Ike and Buddy Lee. You want them to enact their vengeance. This is very much kind of like a Dexter situation where you know that the men that they're going after are bad men and they don't deserve to live anymore. And so you want Ike and Buddy Lee to get their retribution, even though you know it's technically wrong, you know that they're going outside of the law. And so S.A. Cosby was able to just turn all of this into this beautiful story of retribution, absolution, forgiveness, and family. I am extremely grateful for this story, as weird as that sounds. And I just, I just loved it immensely. And I highly recommend if you feel like you can handle the content. All right, so those are my three five-star reads. Now let's go ahead and talk about the four 4.5 star reads, starting with Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. So this is technically historical fiction. It is set in the 1950s and the early 1960s. And it follows our main character, Elizabeth Sott, who is a brilliant chemist during a time when the field of science is not very kind to women. In fact, most fields are not kind to women unless you are basically a teacher or a secretary. You are expected to be a wife at home with the children. And Elizabeth Sott absolutely wants nothing to do with any of that. She is a scientist and she wants to be in a lab and she wants to help change the world. That is what she wants. That is where she's meant to be. That is what makes her happy. So she absolutely rejects social norms and she questions them. But of course she's surrounded by sexist men who don't view things the same way that she does. And even though she is surrounded by scientific men, they view equality through less than scientific lenses. Until she meets Calvin Evans. He is a very gifted and a well-known but kind of moody and loner scientist. And he and Elizabeth Zott end up forming this really beautiful connection. He values Elizabeth for who she is. He doesn't care that she's a woman. He recognizes her brilliance. And so they form this really beautiful relationship. They have a really great bond. And then unfortunately, one day a tragic accident finds Elizabeth not only single, but pregnant as well. And this is something that she never wanted for herself. She never really wanted to have children. I don't even know if she ever wanted to get married. That's just not something that she ever saw from herself. And now she's on her own. She's pregnant. She's having to figure out what to do with this child that she never really wanted. On top of that, her pregnancy finds her fired from the position that she had in the lab. And because of this twist of fate that happens, she actually finds herself the host of an afternoon cooking show. And she ends up using her scientific background in this show because cooking is chemistry. She is on this show. She's not only preparing dishes, but she's also discussing the science behind it. And of course, she's very clueless as to what goes into television and what people actually want to watch. And so like her producer and all this stuff is consistently frustrated with her because they're telling her, okay, let's put you in makeup. Let's put you in these dresses and all that stuff. And she's just not having any of it. She's okay being on the show, but she's going to do things her way. And of course she stirs a lot of pots because of the way that she is and the way that she runs this show. And so she's able to provide a unique and educational approach to cooking. And even though this is not really where she wants to be, she still wants to be in the lab. She recognizes that she can use the show to help empower women. And of course that ends up making her even more enemies. So I rated this 4.5 stars, not necessarily because I absolutely loved the plot or was emotionally connected to the plot because I really wasn't. You know, Elizabeth Zott is a very no-nonsense, blunt individual. I didn't necessarily connect to her as a character, but I appreciated her and I admired her. And I thought that this book was so insanely quotable. There were so many shrewd and observant statements on humanity in this book and the way that we operate. And I really enjoyed that the way that they were put out there because of course, because Elizabeth is a scientist, she's very unemotional. And so a lot of the quotes I could relate to and I appreciated because they were coming coming from a very logical, factual viewpoint, not necessarily an emotional one. So let me go ahead and read to you some of my favorites here. So this one is on religion. She says, I think it lets us off the hook. I think it teaches us that nothing is really our fault, that something or someone else is pulling the strings, that ultimately we are not to blame for the way things are, that to improve things we should pray, but the truth is we are very much responsible for the badness in the world and we have the power to fix it. Men and women are both human beings and as humans, we are byproducts of our upbringings, victims of our lackluster educational systems and choosers of our behaviors. In short, the reduction of women to some something less than men and the elevation of men to something more than women is not biological, it's cultural. And it starts with two words, pink and blue. Everything skyrockets out of control from there. I also appreciated her acknowledgement of the speciesism that humanity tends to have 
over other animals and how we're very ignorant and arrogant in order to have these beliefs. So she says, the animals we consider animals are far more advanced than the animals we are, but don't consider ourselves to be. And then she'll say humans. Some of them didn't seem to grasp their actual status within the animal kingdom. Or I'm thinking you might enjoy Moby Dick. It's a story about how humans continuously underestimate other life forms at their peril. So I really appreciated the acknowledgement that humanity is just so arrogant and cocky that we believe that we are at the top of the food chain and that gives us the right to exploit animals for our own purposes and entertainment, for our food, for our enjoyment. But that's really not the case and we're so misguided in that. So I really loved the messages of that and just the overall messages about the flaws in society in general. Now I will admit that this book was very infuriating at points not because of the plot but because of some of the characters in the plot and it was purposefully done that way. You're supposed to dislike a lot of the characters in this book for the way that they treat Elizabeth Zott. Like I could not even believe some of the things that were said to her simply because she was a woman and she was a woman in science. And this book was so smart because it definitely makes you challenge the status quo because that is what Elizabeth Zott does. And it makes you realize how wrong society often is. Like we spend so much time trying to be what society tells us that we are supposed to be but then in 50 years we're just going to apologize for the way that society thought we were supposed to be. So we're going to start apologizing for the way that society was 50 years ago but yet still in 50 years from now those same people are still going to try to be living up to what society thinks that they should be. So it's just this whole mess that we can never seem to get out of. So overall this book was wonderful. I wasn't necessarily in love with the plot or overly attached to the characters but the characters themselves were fantastic. They were so quirky. They were so full of personality. Even Elizabeth Zott's daughter and her dog were full of personality in the story and they had their own perspectives and their own minds. And I just really appreciated overall for what it said, the messages that it had. It was just wonderfully well written and it is getting adapted. So I'm excited to see what they do with that adaptation. Like I said, 4.5 stars. This is one that I still very much recommend. The next 4.5 that I want to talk to you about is actually another Kristen Hanna and that is Night Road. Surprisingly, the content of the story actually had several similarities to Reminders of Him in that it follows a woman who is being released from prison who had a baby while she was in prison and ended up having to give that baby away to the father of the child. This primarily follows the Faraday family. It follows Jude, her husband, and her two twins, Zach and Mia. And then when Lexi Bale, who is the primary main character in this, kind of moves to town, she is an outsider. She is a former survivor of foster care. She's never really felt like she belonged anywhere. And so when she becomes best friends with Mia, she's accepted by this family and she finally feels like she belongs somewhere until, of course, one night a tragic accident happens. It creates a loss that is so unimaginable that it basically shakes everyone to their core. Nothing will ever be the same again. Lexi has definitely been paying for the mistake that was made. She has been in prison and of course now she is released and she is seeking a relationship with her daughter. So this story is kind of told in the before and the after. So in the before you're following Lexi as she moves to this neighborhood as she befriends Zach and Mia as her relationship with Zach develops into something more and then of course the tragic accident that happened and everything goes from there. I think my only complaint about this story was just kind of the pacing and the tone. So I felt like that first half of the story the before really felt more wide a in terms of just the tone and how it was told because you are following these young teenagers and the events that happened. I really enjoyed the immediate aftermath of the tragedy because I felt like that was really well done and in typical Kristen Hanna fashion you could feel like you were there. So again this was beautifully atmospheric and Kristen Hanna does a really great job of taking you into the tragedy that has occurred. But then it really jumps forward in time. You don't really get a lot of the in-between. So you get the before and you get the after but you don't necessarily get what happened to bridge the before and the after. So, so after the accident after you find out what happens and then Lexi kind of goes to prison. You don't really get any of Lexi's time in prison. Suddenly she's out and she's seeking a relationship with her daughter. So there was a disconnect to me in pacing and tone from the first half of the book to the second half of the book. But again, this was still a beautiful harrowing story. It was very multi-layered with complex characters and definitely complicated family dynamics. As a character driven reader, that is why I love Chris and Hannah so much is because she is able to create these dynamic realistic characters that you just connect to and you root for. And that was no different in here. I actually read this not long after I read Four Winds by Kristen Hanna and not long at all after I read Reminders of Him. So I was getting the same Kristen Hanna vibes with some of the content of Reminders of Him and I don't know if this just hit me because of that because I had just come off of a Kristen Hanna high and a Colleen Hoover high but this just worked for me. It was just so insanely breathtaking and poignant and again harrowing. Harrowing seems to be a common word that I use throughout some of my top books but this was just stunning. This is one of Kristen Hanna's more contemporary novels. It is not historical in nature. So if maybe you have read Kristen Hanna's historical and they haven't worked for you, she definitely does have a backlist 
list of contemporaries and this is one that I would certainly try because this is definitely a family drama. There are definitely a lot of complex, flawed, multi-layered characters in here. There's a lot that's going on. There's a lot to overcome and redemption and forgiveness and all of that good stuff. So this was a strong 4.5 stars. It didn't quite reach the 5 stars but beautiful nonetheless. Another book that was 4.5 and definitely made its way around in the online books community with a lot of well-deserved praise. In My Dreams I Hold a Knife by Ashley Winstead. This is a dark academia novel. It is definitely one of the top dark academia novels I've ever read. I really enjoyed the overall way that the story was told and written. I believe this was Ashley Winstead's debut novel and she absolutely knocked it out of the park. So this follows our main character Jessica Miller and she's about to go back to this like reunion type event at Duquette University which is a private university where she went to college and she's determined to kind of show everybody what a success she is that she is no longer the same girl that she was when she was there when the murder of one of her friends kind of shook up their college campus and of course their tight-knit friendship group. And so she heads back to this reunion where she is reuniting with people that she hasn't really seen in a long time and she's quickly finding out that not everybody left Duquette, not everybody left behind the murder and some people are not willing to let it go unsolved and they're not going to let it go until justice is served. And so you're following Jessica in the present timeline as she's heading to Duquette and what's happening when she's reuniting with these people that she hasn't really seen or spoken to in many many years and then you are jumping back in time to their actual college days and what I like about the past timeline was that it was not linear so you weren't just following them through freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. You were following all of those years but they were mixed up in a jumble so it was kind of like a little bit of a puzzle as you were following them as they are meeting and the events that are happening and then you are seeing some of the events that you might have read about say in junior or senior year you're seeing how they kind of came about when you were jumping back to the freshman and sophomore perspective so I thought that that was really well done very cleverly told I like the way that Ashley Winstead did that instead of telling that in a more linear time frame there were definitely a lot of different layers going on here because they definitely had several friends within their friend group so you're following each of them over time over their years in college you're following them in the present in the present day if I remember correctly you are only getting Jessica's perspective so it's told in first person but then in the past you are getting third person views from every single character you know throughout their years in college so you're definitely getting a multi-layered story here a story that's not necessarily linear you're kind of having to piece things together as the reader and I just really enjoyed the way that it was told I actually really enjoyed the outcome the reveal of course you know that one of these people is guilty you don't know who and you don't know why and that was the fun of the reveal I just was really impressed by the way that Ashley Winston was able to weave the narrative it was so good it was definitely very atmospheric you know you have this very small private New England setting it definitely gives you the dark academia vibes that you are looking for when you are reading this type of story this just scratched the dark academia itch you know this really really did what I wanted it to do so I was highly impressed this was a stunning debut novel I loved all of the individual relationships between the different characters and the friend group that was interesting because they all had their own unique dynamics you know and that all played into what happened in the past what's happening into the present it was just fantastic highly recommend 4.5 stars of course and the last 4.5 star book that I want to talk to you about today is one that I only just recently read so you've probably heard me talk about it a lot book lovers by Emily Henry so of course this is a book by a book lover for book lovers and I absolutely loved every second of the story so this follows our main character Nora Stevens she is a big time New York literary agent she is considered cutthroat because she is willing to do whatever she has to do for her clients she's very dedicated to her work she's very singularly focused when it comes to her work so a lot of the time people on the outside can kind of see her as cold and unfeeling but that's really not who she is the reason that she is the way that she is kind of stems back from the trauma of her mother's unexpected death I believe it was like 10 years prior when she was in her early 20s and her sister Libby was in her teens and so Nora kind of had to take on the role of mother unexpectedly to Libby it was something that she had some experience with because her mother wasn't necessarily neglectful or irresponsible but she was the artist type she was a wannabe actor and so sometimes she was kind of out there trying to fulfill her dreams and leaving Nora to be the responsible parent of Libby but after their mother died it just kind of devastated them both because they loved their mother they were very close to their mother and so now that's all transferred into the present as Nora is trying to make sure that Libby has everything that she needs at any given point but at the time of the start of this novel you know Libby is grown she's married she's got two children and one on the way Nora really doesn't need to take it upon herself to take care of Libby anymore but she still feels that instinctual need to do so and these two sisters who were once inseparable very close I, I don't necessarily say that they have grown apart because they are still very close but they don't necessarily confide in each other as much as they used to so there's definitely a small little gap in their relationship and Nora absolutely feels it and so when Libby suggests that they go ahead and take several weeks of vacation in this small town in North Carolina if I remember correctly I believe it was Sunshine Falls Nora's like okay let's do it she absolutely wants to get her relationship back on track with Libby she knows that Libby kind of needs a break before her third baby comes and so they head to Sunshine Falls North Carolina and the reason why Libby wanted to go to Sunshine Falls is because it's the setting of this mega popular book that Nora helped get published and Libby is a super fan of the book and so she wants to go she wants to live in this town and she has a checklist of everything she wants Nora and herself to experience while they are in this town so you see them head to Sunshine Falls North Carolina and it quickly becomes apparent that there is something more going on with 
Libby, something that she is not sharing with Nora. And so of course that makes Nora very, very anxious. She doesn't understand why Libby is not confiding in her. And also Nora is a fixer. She wants to fix everything for Libby, but she can't do that if Libby doesn't tell her what's going on. And on top of that, Nora runs into Charlie Lastra, the last person she would have expected to see in Sunshine Falls. Charlie Lastra is an editor and Charlie is actually somebody that Nora approached a couple of years prior to when this mega popular book was published because she wanted Charlie's help in editing the book and helping to get it published. But Charlie hated the book, expressed that right off the bat to Nora. So they had a very unfortunate first meeting with each other. It was very unpleasant. But now, of course, this book has been published. It's mega popular. Everybody loves it. And so when she is bumping into Charlie Lastra in this small town in North Carolina, the last place she would expect him to be, needless to say, she's floored. Of course, they end up talking and start building this friendship and something more. The banter between them is chef's kiss perfection. It was absolutely phenomenal. Emily Henry just has this way of writing banter that is fantastic. It is my humor perfectly. There's also a scene in here regarding Bigfoot erotica and holy cow was I giggling because it was just so funny. Like that tickled my funny bone immensely. So there was a lot of humor and a lot of heart in this story. Sunshine Falls actually turns out to be Charlie's hometown and he's had to return there to kind of help with his parents because his dad has some health issues and his mom has to take care of his dad but his mom also owns this little small struggling bookstore there and so Charlie is running the bookstore while he's also being a long distance editor. So Charlie has a lot of things going on. He also has a lot of his own emotional reactions to the town. It's a town that he never wanted to return turn back to. He's always felt very claustrophobic and stifled in this town. He's never really felt like he's been accepted or belonged there. And so now he's back in this town where he doesn't really want to be. So he and Nora are connecting over books. They're connecting over their own family issues that they are dealing with. They both seem to see each other for who they are. They can see past all of the BS straight down to the other person. And watching the development of their relationship was just absolutely fantastic. You could absolutely feel the chemistry between them. I loved it. But this wasn't just a love story between Charlie and Nora. In fact, I would say it was equal a love story between Charlie and Nora as it was a focus on the sister relationship between Nora and Libby as they find their way kind of back to each other. So you are getting Charlie and Nora, you're getting Nora and Libby, the truths that are revealed and that have to be overcome. And again, this is another very multi-layered story. It was very dynamic. I absolutely loved both of the main relationships that were in this story. It was just so fantastic. Emily Henry is easily becoming one of my favorite contemporary authors. I will read probably absolutely everything that she writes from now on. This is, this is certainly her best yet, no question. She does have a new release coming out in 2023, which could beat this. Who knows? It just seems like she keeps getting better and better and better. I was so excited to have loved this as much as I did. And this was an easy 4.5 stars for me. All right, y'all, that is it. Those were the highest rated books that I read in 2022. If you have read any of these books, please be sure to comment down below and let me know what you thought. Do you agree with my opinions? Do you disagree with my opinions? And please also be sure and let me know what the top books you read in 2022 were. I would love to know. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already, because I would sure love to see you in my next video. Bye guys.